Hello there, friends. Folche Tranonawa Mokharjigalair. Good evening, my friends. Our foot on down all around the world. Welcome to Live Irish Mits. Oh, to turn that speaker off. <laughs> That's live TV. Welcome to Live Irish Mits. I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. This is episode 86. Ochto is a shay. Augustanucht. And tonight we are talking about Nashiog, the fairies, for the first time. Uh, of probably several episodes dealing with the fairies. And I know that uh, there's been much anticipation of this for me, this subject, because uh, it was suggested a good long time ago. And I'm glad to be able to fulfill that at last. Uh, sorry, I'll just make a tiny adjustment to the YouTube camera. <laughs> Apologies, YouTubers. It's like I always check that as a last resort, you know. I do, I do apologize. Um, You'll have seen, I hope many of you will have seen the live broadcast earlier on announcing uh, Tuesday's episode, which hopefully will be episode 90, which I will be co-hosting with the wonderful Morgan Daimler. And the subject will be the emergence of fairy folklore from the original mythology of the deities, the Tuatha Dé Danann. Hope you're looking forward to that. I'm just going to see, actually, uh, if you don't mind, if Caitlin Moon was the one who suggested that episode. So that'll be episode 90. In the meantime, good evening, everybody. Welcome along to Chalk Waraku. It's seven o'clock Irish time, an hour earlier than normal. I see most of you have arrived. There's 177 watching on Facebook and seven on YouTube. Archaeoastronomy Database is the first commenter on YouTube. I know this is one, this one has been much anticipated by many. Yes, indeed. Erica Bow says Tronoa to all. Fall to Erica. The other Erica, Erica Rivertree, says Banachti, oh, Louisville, Kentucky. Hope you are keeping safe and well, Erica. Uh, Daisy Peters, Fall to my dear Tua de Mythflix, Anthony, and everyone. I'm looking forward to this marvellous episode. Good stuff, Daisy. Wonderful to have you along, as it always is. Mandy McCurl says, hello, everyone. A wild wind blowing with squalls and sunshine. Weird weather. Yes, indeed. We were just talking about that a moment ago, myself and my wife, about how much different it is from Monday, the bank holiday, when it was hot and sunny and the place was baking, you know. Greg B says, hello, fall to Greg. Murdoch Machandri says, I can't stay, but wanted to pop in to say hello, and I'll have to catch the video later. That's absolutely perfectly okay, Murdoch. We'll see you later on. And on Facebook, I've lost all the comments. Oh, my goodness me, look at this. Margaret Ring is the first of the watchers tonight. Margaret, fall to. Hope you are well and that life is not too stressful for you today. Paula Snow Queen says, wave, fall to. Rowan Grove says, Hello from Colorado. Hope all are well. All in great form, Rowan, so far. Giorich. Serena Swift says, hello, Anthony. And to all, Fulcha, Serena. Serena. Guido Bruce is watching. Hello, Guido. Tracy O'Connor is watching. Fulcha, Tracy. Guido says a very wet good evening from the Netherlands. Well, we had a couple of very heavy showers today. The sun is shining right now, but it's cold and windy. Aaron Durrett is watching. Fulcha, Aaron. Ermi Nicolaides says hello from Munich in Germany. Falcha Ermi, very nice to have you along for live Irish Mitt. Stephen Greer says hello from Little Rock, Arkansas. Hello, Stephen Tranonawa. Cheryl Ann McFetridge says cheers, Anthony from Boston and kisses. Grow more, Cheryl Ann. Welcome along. Mal Duddy says hello from Muff in County Donegal. Falcha and good evening to you, Mal. Helen Guinan is watching. Your Majesty. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter says, Hello, Anthony. Love that you can pronounce my surname correctly. Oh, <laughs> there's a first time for everything. Yvette Tillema says, Good good day to a uh, good evening, Anthony. Hello, Yvette. Welcome back. Dave Russell says, Cursing and swearing at this bloody van build. Anthony, give me some happy news. <laughs> Hi, <-ho. laughs> Some happy news. Uh, it's Friday. Uh, Steve Martinson says, yay, fairies tonight. Thank you, Anthony, and your lovely guest, Morgan. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Really, really looking forward to that. What I have to do on Tuesday is just remember to shut my mouth and let uh, Morgan do the talk. Sorry, I was just taking a screenshot there. Uh, I think that's a record. I've never seen 255 viewers. Helen says, good evening, Anthony Murphy, and all the two of us. Indeed, Your Majesty. I hope life is good in the palace. Kathy Mark says, good afternoon from Iowa. Falcha, Kathy. Camilla Relland is watching. Hello, Camilla. Vicky Wallace-Southern says, hello, my lovely friends. And hello to you, Vicky. And also to Evan, if he's watching. Evan, I hope you've been enjoying playing Pokemon. Amanda Moyle says, hello from California. Giagrich. Kelly Minich is watching. Hello, Kelly. Pardon me. Paula Snow Queen is selling, sending Felicoin. No, they're fairies. They just look like butterflies. I apologize. Couldn't see them properly. 
Kristen Gray Taggart says, Banachti, Anthony Augustua, hope you're all well today. Movanacht Ort, Kristen. Joy Buchner Winkles says, hello from Minnesota. Hope life is good in Minnesota, Joy. What a wonderful, joyous name. Paul Garron says, good evening, friend, Anthony. Good evening to a clan Air. Falsha, Paul, you're very welcome. Grab your usual seat. Hope you have a brew. By the way, I'm just letting you know, tonight mine is a half glass of white wine, which I may take the occasional sip from. If I start slurring my speech later, you'll know just what the problem is. Kelly Edmiston says, hello, my peeps. <laughs> Falsha, Kelly. Tom King says, good evening, Anthony, and all the might, mighty Tua. Really looking forward to this one. Great to have you along, Tom, as it always is. Sinead O'Reilly says, greetings from London, UK. Falsha, Sinead, a very good evening to you. Tracy says, watch your back with the fairies tonight. They could be up to some tricks. <laughs> yes, always treat them with respect. That's the main thing. Margaret Ring says, hello, everyone. Watching while having dinner. Well... Pleasure on the double, Margaret, hey? That's the life. Susan Scott says, hello, Anthony, and all the two. A happy Friday, HHH here in uh, Connecticut. That is hazy, hot, and humid. But I'm not complaining. I'm in the studio, taking a break and pulling up a chair to listen along. Brilliant stuff, Susan. Falsha. Aaron Durrett says, how do you love to Anthony and the dear Tua? Grow more from all the Tua across the ocean to you, Aaron. Camilla Rellan says, good full moon eclipse evening all. Should just mention that there is... Uh, penumbral eclipse of the moon this evening uh, it is happening kind of mostly before the moon rises and in any cases penumbral eclipses are very difficult to see because it's just a very slight dimming of the moon uh, the one to get really excited about is the total eclipse of the sun in two weeks time on the day of summer solstice if you're in africa oh boy that is the one to see a ring because it's a penannular eclipse where the moon is a little bit further away uh, and uh, it's not big enough to cover the whole of the sun so it will leave a ring of fire um quote uh cue the johnny cash music which i'm not going to sing in case facebook bans me they could ban me for copyright but they're more likely to ban me for just bad singing Paul Garon, have we lost on Kriach? I, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a message about that, Paul. We have, but there's a good reason for it, and it's fair enough. Angel Barboni Smith says, hello, love you all. Falcha Angel, what a wonderful name. Cheryl Ann McFetridge says, cheers to Anthony and everyone. From Boston with kisses, Cheryl Ann Falcha. Keith Carmody says, hi, Anthony and everyone. Hope all's going well. Well, it's going good so far. Finished work for the weekend. Looking forward to doing more proofreading on the 2020 edition of Island of the Setting Sun, which I'm making progress on. Be going to the printers hopefully in a couple of weeks' time. And all going well. We'll have copies available uh, in early August. Oh, yeah. On that note, probably should mention that I'm going to share the link where you can purchase or pre-order uh, a signed copy uh, well, it'll be signed by me anyway. I'm going to try and get Richard Moore to sign them as well. Can't promise that, but certainly I will pro I will sign them. Uh, Pre-order your signed copy on the Mythical Ireland website at the link that I'm just sharing underneath the video right now. Okay, Pat Rowan is watching. Fault you, Pat. Patricia Lochran McTagg says hello. Gia Rich. Gina Locke says hello. Gia Rich. Jennifer Dudley Nelson says hi. Gia Rich. 222 viewers says Paul Garron. And imagine you're one of them. Isn't it great? Patricia McTeer is watching. Fault you, Patricia. Christina Zaba says hello from Bristol, listening while watering my veg garden. Sounds absolutely fantastic. Sinead O'Reilly says it's lunar eclipse weather. Well, usually what happens when there's a one-off astronomical event in Ireland is it's cloudy and you don't get to see it. Jim Conway, I posted a link in the community site to the mythology of Lee Bon, the Loch Nain mermaid and her link to Newgrange. Brilliant stuff, Jim. That's something I don't know anything about and I must follow that up. Um, that's something that could make an episode or a part episode. Katie McMahon waves, waving right back at you, Katie. Patricia McAteer says, hello all, fall to Patricia. That Natalia Lopez says, hi, Anthony. Work has prevented me from watching live, but I'm catching up on YouTube. Take care and thanks as always. Uh, Natalia, and it's nice to see you. Nora Gaffney O'Connor says, hello, Anthony and Tua. All ready for the moon tonight. Shall be heading for a moonlight swim, social distancing with some friends and a flask. Whoa, very nice, Nora. Enjoy that. Angel o Oliva says, hello from... Hi, Hylia? Hi, Hylia? Florida. 
Never heard of that place, but it's very nice for you to join us, Angel. A few angels on tonight. Barb Jordan, a few angels and a few fairies. Barb Jordan says, hi, everyone. That Helen Guinan one, she's an awful fairy. But Barb Jordan says, hi, everyone. Falls you. Alwyn Roy Badzek says, good evening, Anthony and Tua. Looking forward to the fairy stories. Good stuff, Alwyn. Nice to have you along. Kimberly Halligan says, hi, all from New York City. This is a welcome part of my day. Thank you, Anthony and Tua. Falcha, Kimberly. It's nice to have you along. John McAndrew says, good afternoon from Rochester, New York. Good evening. Good afternoon to you, John. Janet O'Leary says, hi from Carrigaline. Falcha, Janet. Lovely to have you along. Take a seat. Make yourself comfortable. Grab a dram or a brew. Ternonawa from Coatbridge, Scotland, says Neil Hughes. Have you heard the song Bruna Bonia by the Wolf Tones? It's brilliant. Uh, I think I have, but I couldn't sort of. I th yes, I think I have. Uh, there are other songs uh, by the Wolf Tones that we couldn't possibly repeat. Theresa McGuinness says, Muggy, cloudy, Callahan, Florida. Cristobal is the storm still far south in the Gulf. Winds churning all over. Yeah, we seem to have them on this side too, Theresa. Uh, Mona Lee Peterson says, good day to you from Canada. Fall to Mona. Very nice to have you along. Sinead O'Reilly sending fairies. Melanie Lynn is watching. Happy birthday to your pony, Melanie. Uh, 18, is that right? Oh, what was the pony's name? Oh, I saw the post today. Mm, I can't remember the pony's name. You'll have to tell me. Ger Moan says, hi all. Full moon blessings. Good evening to you, Ger Falcha. Nolan Proctor says, hello from sunny Pennsylvania. Good evening to you. Anya O'Rooney says, good day to you from Canada. <coughs> Excuse me. Theresa McGuinness says, my dragonflies can pass as fairies at a distance. Mary McMullen says, hello from the Irish Beef Netherlands. Fall to you, Mary. Nice to see you. Reese Casterton says, hello, Anthony and Tua. Hope all are happy and well. All good so far, Reese. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Bit of a tickle in the throat. I may re require some um, liquid sustenance in a moment. In the form of water, of course. What else did you think it was going to be? Nick Eska Casterton says, hello, Anthony and the Tua. Happy Friday to you all. Indeed, and many happy returns, Nick. <laughs> Servus from Bavaria says Dagmar Wilhelm thanks for your very interesting episodes on Irish myths nice of you to say so Dagmar and very nice to have you along Me hello Anthony says Melanie and the two at love Yates brilliant stuff why are you on an hour early says Scott uh, I've always done Fridays er an hour early because it's date night that's when me and my wife spend a bit of time together uh, without the distraction of live Irish myths. So there you go. Mike Naylor says, Mike and Jeanette in New Jersey, in Princeton, of course, say good afternoon, Anthony and dear people. Lovely to see you, folks. Megan Walter says hello, everyone. Gia Glitch. Uh, do -do 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 -do. Hello from County Wexford, says Petra Sengas. Hello, Petra Falche. Scott Taggart says, not that I'm complaining. Gia Glitch, August Falche to a Indeed. Thank you, Scott. Kathy Mark says, I just pre-ordered my copy today. Brilliant stuff. Hopefully you'll get that. Just a, uh, just a reminder, if you're thinking about pre-ordering on Amazon, you will not get your copy of Island of the Setting Sun until late November. But if you pre-order on mythicalireland.com, I'm hoping that you will have your copy in early August. Mariana Dunn says, happy Friday, dear Tua and Anthony from Virginia. Just got home in time. Brilliant stuff, Mariana. Great to see you. Trina New York says, good evening from a rainy, finally, Marburg in Germany. Greetings to all the Tua. Folge, Trina. Federica Guy says, hello, Anthony and Tua. Hope everyone is well. And we thought we weren't going to see you except for on the weekends. Ciao, Federica. Lovely to have you along every day. Fionishka Sirsha says, Djigic as Humboldt County, California. Hello, indeed. Nice of you to join us from California. Robin Edgar uh, says, low end synchronicity alert. I forgot you were starting at 2 p.m. today and was in the middle of listening to this YouTube video of the Dead Can Dance song, Children of the Sun, which I think you will like when the live stream window popped up. Now to crack open a can of Mill Street's Brewery's Cobblestone Nitro Stout. Do you know any ancient Irish toasts? Mm. That's a good question. Not immediately offhand is the, is the, is the answer. Alex Casterton says he's looking forward to this. Hopefully we can satisfy your craving. Cindy Daniels Graven is watching. Falcha, Cindy, lovely to see you. Judy McQueen says hello all, Jigwich. Uh, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Story is the name of 
Melanie's horse. Yes. I knew it was something like that. I had my doubts. I was doubting myself for a moment. What is going on with my uh, brightness? I was in the dark there for a minute. Paula Snow Queen says, wine. <laughs> Scott Taggart says, whiskey. <laughs> and I wouldn't blame you. Indeed. And Susan Scott says, lol, wine. Rainy Today says, Wendy Holmes, good day for fairy stories. Dean T says, Ray and Bose, Tony and Group and Slaunch It Tonight on Friday. Good to have you along. Eva Anderson says, good evening, everyone. It's been raining today on Gothenburg, but the evening is bright and beautiful. Good stuff. Eugen Udon says, never mind. Could somebody uh, block and report Eugen Udon, please? You know what to do. And once you do that, it'll get rid of his spamming. Danilo Paparello says, ciao, Anthony. Happy Friday and good weekend from Italy. Always a great pleasure to have our friends along from Italy. Danilo, good evening to you. Laura Odomatroy is back. Hello, Anthony. May you have a blessed, may you all have a blessed, may you have all a blessed Friday. And the same right back at you, Laura. Bless, blessings to Blessington. Michael Marr is watching. Michael, have you got nothing better to do? <laughs> I was going to say, you must be hard up for entertainment. <laughs> uh, me and Michael know each other, and we share a sort of similar, uh, very low level of humour. <laughs> Juliana da Silva says, hello from Brazil. Falsche, Juliana. It's lovely to see you. Uh, whiskey and McCoons and Hobgoblin. Slaunche, says Alex. Mm, indeed. Good. Yes, yeah, so you know what to do with the spammer. Just report and block. Lisa Kendrick says, a peaceful live show in the middle of swirling violence. Thank you. Greetings from the East Coast of the United States. Good evening, Lisa. Stay safe and stay well. Daniel Kedney says, Banakti, greetings. Desde, Mexico. Always a pleasure to have you in the house, Daniel. Austin Davies says, late in today, but better late than never. And sure, we haven't even started the story yet, as usual, because I'm rambling on. Let's call it 17 minutes. Uh, I want to say thank you for today's image of the forest. Uh, and that was from Michael Schwarzenberger on pixabay.com. Very nice of him. <coughs> Some people like to share their imagery for free on pixabay.com, which is a great site if you want to source some free imagery for use in your graphics. Uh, Bernie Courtney says, am I early today? Are you early tonight? I'm confused. Glass of wine needed, I think. Bernie, we always do one hour earlier on a Friday evening, 7 p.m., uh, 8 p.m. every other night. So there you are. Tonight, we're reading about the fairies, and we are reading from uh, uh, the Book of Fairy and Folk Tales of Ireland, compiled by our very famous, uh, wonderful poet, uh, W.B. Yeats. So I'm going to read a few little short snippets and a few short stories. Margaret, we're glad to hear that your daughter is okay. That's great news. Excuse me. <coughs> One may have to take a lozenge before too long. And so, sure, look, where do we start except for at the start, at the beginning? You know, the road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Looks like the Casterton's are, I think you guys have the right idea. All sitting around. What is that combination? Whiskey and a few pints of Ruby Hobgoblin and McEwan's Export. Grant's Whiskey. Do you know, I've never tried Grant's Whiskey. But uh, I'll have to add it to my list. That is my list of, I want to try this whiskey. <laughs> the Irish word for fairy is sheog, and that is spelt S-I-D-H-E-O for the G. A diminutive of she in banshee. Fairies are dina she, the fairy people. Who are they? <laughs> Fallen angels who were not good enough to be saved nor bad enough to be lost, say the peasantry. The gods of the earth, says the Book of Armagh. The gods of pagan Ireland, say the Irish antiquarians. The Tua de Danon who, when no longer worshipped and fed with offerings, dwindled away in the popular imagination and now are only a few spans high. And uh, this is the main area 
that we will be discussing on Tuesday night's episode. Uh, that is at 8 p.m., the normal time. Uh, and my co-host for that episode, as you may have seen on the announcement earlier today, will be uh, the author, Morgan Daimler, who has specialised in the study of fairy lore and particularly Irish fairy lore and the, all of the mythology as well. She's written lots of books about the Irish deities. And they will tell you in proof that the names of fairy chiefs are the names of old Danon heroes and the places where they especially gather together, Danon burying, burial places. And that the two, he has a, a father on the second day here, which would suggest it's Danon. But uh, we usually pronounce it Tua de Danon. And that the Tua de Danon used to be called the Slua Shi, the fairy host, or Markra Shi, the fairy cavalcade. On the other hand, there is much evidence to prove them fallen angels. Witness the nature of the creatures, their caprice, their way of being good to the good and evil to the evil, having, having every charm but conscience consistency. Beings so quickly offended that you must not speak much about them at all and never call them anything but the gentry or else the Dina Maha, which in English means the good people, yet so easily pleased. They will do their best to keep misfortune away from you if you leave a little milk for them on the windowsill overnight. On the whole, the popular beliefs tell us most about them telling us how they fell and yet were not lost because their evil was wholly without malice. Sorry, just one second. Do you remember I had to type something? Um, uh, are they the gods of the earth? Perhaps many poets and all mystic and occult writers in all ages and countries have declared that behind the visible are chains of conscious, or sorry, chains on chains of conscious beings who are not of heaven, but of the earth, who have no inherent form, but change according to their whim or the mind that sees them. You cannot lift your hand without influencing and being influenced by the hordes. The visible world is merely their skin. In dreams, we go amongst them and play with them and combat with them. They are perhaps human souls in the crucible, these creatures of whim. <clears throat> Do not think the fairies are always little. Everything is capricious about them, even their size. They seem to take what size or shape pleases them. Their chief occupations are feasting, fighting and making love and playing the most beautiful music. Sounds, sounds like the modern Irish. <clears throat> Perhaps they wear their shoes out with dancing. Near the village of Balasodere is a little woman who lived among them seven years. When she came home, she had no toes. She had danced them off. <laughs> they have three great festivals in the year, May Eve, Midsummer Eve, and November Eve. That would be to you and I, Bialtana, uh, Midsummer, and uh, Samhain. On May Eve, every seventh year, they fight all round, but mostly on the plain of Bawn, wherever that is. For the harvest, for the best years of grain, belong to them. An old man told me he saw them fight once. They tore the thatch off a house in the midst of it all. Megan Walter says a small butterfly has been flying around my feet but refuses to be photographed. Sounds wonderful. Yes, perhaps you should just put the camera away. Uh, had, had anyone... <laughs> Had anyone else been near, they would merely have seen a great wind whirling everything into the air as it passed. When the wind makes the straws and leaves whirl as it passes, that is the fairies. And the peasantry take off their hats and say, God bless them. On Midsummer Eve, when the bonfires are lighted on every hill in honour of Maeve Owen, 
or St. John. The fairies are at their gayest and sometimes steal away beautiful mortals to be their brides. <coughs> Excuse me. On November Eve at Samhain, they are at their gloomiest, for according to the old Gaelic reckoning, this is the first night of winter. This night they dance with the ghosts and the puka is abroad and witches make their spells and girls set a table with food in the name of the devil that the fetch of their future lover may come through the window and eat of the food. After November Eve, the blackberries are no longer wholesome for the puka has spoiled them. And that is, of course, uh, uh, a long-standing uh, folk belief that you shouldn't eat uh, the blackberries after Samhain, uh, that basically the devil has spat on them. When they are angry, they paralyze men and cattle with their fairy darts. When they are gay, they sing. Many a poor girl has heard them and pined away and died for love of that singing. Plenty of the old, beautiful tunes of Ireland are only their music caught up by eavesdroppers. No wise peasant would hum the pretty girl milking the cow near a fairy wrath, for they are joyous and do not like to hear their songs on clumsy mortal lips. Carolyn, the last of the Irish bards, slept on a wrath, and even after the fairy tunes ran in his head and made him the great man he was. Do they die? Blake saw a fairy's funeral, but in Ireland we say, they are immortal. And this is a poem about the fairies by William Allingham. Up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we daren't go a-hunting for fear of the little men. We folk, good folk, trooping all together, green jacket, red cap, and white owl's feather. Very interesting with regards to Kalyach Icha, Ulchawan, but Kalyach Icha, the Kalyach of the night, the, the owl. Down along the rocky shore, some make their home. They live on crispy pancakes of yellow tied foam. Some in the reeds of the black mountain lake, with frogs for their watchdogs, all night awake. High on the hilltop, the old king sits. He is now so old and grey, he's nigh lost his wits. With a bridge of white mist, column kill he crosses on his stately journeys from Schlieve League to Rosses. Or going up with music on cold, starry nights to sup with the queen of the gay northern lights. They stole little Bridget for seven years long. When she came down again, her friends were all gone. They took her lightly back between the night and morrow. They thought that she was fast asleep, but she was dead with sorrow. They have kept her ever since deep within the lake, on a bed of flag leaves, watching till she wake. By the craggy hillside, through the mosses bare, they have planted thorn trees for pleasure here and there. Is any man so daring as dig them up in spite? He shall find their sharpest thorns in his bed at night. Up the airy mountain, down the rushy glen, we daren't go a-hunting for fear of little men. We folk, good folk, trooping all together, green jacket, red cap. And white owl's feather. Uh, and in that, uh, the 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 uh, the verse about the thorn trees. If any man so daring as dig them up in spite, he shall find their sharpest thorns in his bed at night. And of course, the thorn trees, the hawthorn trees in particular, and sometimes blackthorn, but mostly the hawthorn or the the white thorn bushes. Uh, especially the lone ones that grow in their own on a on a on a uh, in a ditch or especially in a field, you daren't touch those. You do not damage a fairy tree. And believe it or not, there is many a farmer and a landowner today who still won't touch the hawthorns, uh, in deference to the good people. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, you will find in the folklore archives many a story about how great disaster came upon the farmer or the landowner who tried to pick one up or damage or, or cut it down. And the next story is by William Carlton, and it's called Frank Martin and the Fairies. Martin was a thin, pale man when I saw him, of a sickly look and a constitution naturally feeble. His hair was a light auburn, his beard mostly unshaven, and his hands of a singular delicacy and whiteness, owing, I dare say, as much to the soft and easy nature of his employment as to his infirm health. <laughs> it must have been a pen pusher. <laughs> it must have been an office worker, a white, white collar worker. <laughs> In everything else, he was as sensible, sober and rational as any other man. But on the topic of fairies, the man's mania was particularly strong and immovable. Indeed, I remember that the expression of his eyes was singularly wild and hollow and his long, narrow temples, sallow and emaciated. Now, this man did not lead an unhappy life, nor did the malady he laboured under seem to be productive of either pain or terror to him, although one might be apt to imagine otherwise. On the contrary, he and the fairies maintained the most friendly intimacy, and their dialogues, which I fear were woefully one-sided ones must have been a source of great pleasure to him, for they were conducted with much mirth and laughter on his part, at least. Well, Frank, when did you see the fairies? Whisht, there's two dozen of them in the shop, the weaving shop, this minute. There's a little old fellow sitting on the top of the sleighs, and all to be rocked while I'm waving. The sorrow's in them, but they're the greatest little schemers alive, a schemer. So they are. See, there's another of them at my dress and noggin. Go out of that, you shingwan. Shingon. Bad cess to me if you don't, but I'll leave you a mark. Ha! Cut, you thief, you. Frank, aren't you afeard of them? Is it me, Ara, what would be afeard of them for? That's exactly what it says. Is it me, Ara? What did I be afeard of them for? Should they have no power over me? And why haven't they, Frank? Because I was baptised against them. What do you mean by that? Why, the priest that christened me was told, told, T-O-U-L-D, <laughs> I love the colloquial pronunciations, was told by my father to put in the proper prayer against the fairies, and a priest can't refuse it when he's asked. And he did so. Begara, it's well for me that he did. Let the tallow alone, you little glutton. See, there's a weenie thief of them eating my tallow. Because, you see, it was their intention to make me king of the fairies. Is it possible? Devil a lie in it. Sure you may ask them. And they'll tell you. What size are they, Frank? Oh, little wee fellows with green coats. And the purest little shoes you ever seen. Sorry, purtiest. The purtiest little shoes you ever seen. There's two of them, bo both old acquaintances of mine, running along the yarn beam. That old fella with the bob wig is called Jim Jam. And the other chap with the, with the three cocked hat is called Nicky Nick. Nicky plays the pipes. Nicky, give us a tune. Or I'll malavogue you. Come on now, lock her in shore. Hush now, listen. The poor fellow, though weaving as fast as he could all the time, yet bestowed every possible mark of attention to the music and seemed to enjoy it as much, uh, as, much as if it had been real. But who can tell whether that which we look upon as a privation may not after all be a fountain of increased happiness, greater perhaps than any which we ourselves enjoy? I forget who the poet is who says, Mysterious are thy laws, the visions finer than the view, her landscape nature never drew, so fair as fancy draws. Many a time when a mere child, not more than six or seven years of age, have I gone as far as Frank's weaving shop, 
in order, with a heart divided between curiosity and fear, to listen to his conversation with the good people. From morning till night, his tongue was going almost as incessantly as his shuttle. And it was well known that at night, whenever he awoke out of his sleep, the first thing he did was to put out his hand and push them, as it were, off his bed. <laughs> Get out of this, you thieves. You, go out of this now and leave me alone. Nicky, is this any time to be playing the pipes? And me wants to sleep. Get off now. Troth if you do. You'll see what I'll give yous tomorrow. Sure, I'll be making you dressings. And if yous behave decently, maybe I'll leave yous the scraping of the pot. Gillian Smith is here. Hello, Gillian Fulcher. There now. Oh, poor things. They're days and craters. <laughs> and that's spelled D-A-C-E-N-T, which is how some of us colloquial Irish would say decent, decent, eyes decent. And craters, which basically means creatures. C-R-A-T-H-U-R-S, craters. Sure, they're all gone, barren, po barren, barren poor red cap that doesn't like to lave me. Lave, L-A-V-E. And then the harmless monomaniac would fall back into what we trust was an innocent slumber. About this time, there was said to have occurred a very remarkable circumstance, which gave poor Frank a vast deal of importance among the neighbours. A man named Frank Thomas, the same in whose house Mickey McRory held the first dance at which I ever saw him, as detailed in a former sketch. This man, I say, had a child sick, but out but of what complaint I cannot now remember, nor is it of any importance. One of the gables of Thomas's house was built against, or rather into, a fourth, a fourth, or rath, fort spelt with a H at the end, fourth, or rath, called Towney, or properly Tona Fourth. It was said to be haunted by the fairies. And what gave it a character peculiarly wild in my eyes that were there on the southern side of it two or three little green mounds which are said to be the graves of unchristened children over which it was considered dangerous and unlucky to pass. At all events, the season was midsummer and one evening about dusk during the illness of the child the noise of a hand saw was heard upon the fourth. This was considered rather strange and after a little time, a few of those who were assembled at Frank Thomas's went to see who it could be that was sawing in such a place. Or what they could be sawing at so late an hour. For everyone knew that nobody in the whole country about them would dare to cut down the few white thorns that grew upon the fourth. On going to examine, however, judge of their surprise when, after surrounding and searching the whole place, they could discover no trace of either saw or sawyer. In fact, with the exception of themselves, there was no one, either natural or supernatural, visible. They then returned to the house and had scarcely sat down when it was heard again within ten yards of them. Another examination of the premises took place, but with equal success, or equal lack of success, if you prefer. Now, however, while standing on the fourth, they heard the sawing in a little hollow about 150 yards below them, which was completely exposed to, to their view, but they could, see, they could see nobody. A party of them immediately went down to ascertain, if possible, what this singular noise and invisible labour could mean. But on arriving at the spot, they heard the sawing, to which were now added hammering and the driving of nails upon the fourth above, whilst those who stood on the fourth continued to hear it in the hollow. On comparing notes, they resolved to send down to Billy Nelson's for Frank Martin, a distance of only about 80 or 90 yards. He was soon on the spot and without a moment's hesitation, solved the enigma. "'Tis the fairies,' said he. "'I see them, and busy craters they are. "'But what are they sawing, Frank?' "'They are making a child's coffin,' he replied. "'They have the body already made, and now they are nailing the lid together.' That night, the child died, and the story goes that on the second evening afterwards, the carpenter who was called upon to make the coffin brought a table out from Thomas's house to the fourth as a temporary bench, and it is said that the sawing and hammering necessary for the completion of his task were precisely the same which had been heard the evening but one before. Neither more nor less. 
I remember the death of the child myself and the making of its coffin, but I think the story of the supernatural carpenter was not heard in the village for some months after its interment. Frank had every appearance of a hypochondriac about him. At the time I saw him, he might be about 34 years of age, but I do not think from the debility of his frame and infirm health that he has been alive for several years. He was an object of considerable interest and curiosity, and often I have been present when he was pointing out to strangers the man that could see the good people. Sad end to that story, huh? Now, there's a couple of longer ones. I might keep those for another episode. Or will I, I'll read the next one and then I'll, the one afterwards I will keep. Yeah. This is called The Priest's Supper. And this is originally uh, recorded by T. T. Crofton Croker. I think that's Thomas, isn't it? Thomas Crofton Croker, I believe. Some of these stories were collected by Douglas Hyde, by the way. Douglas Hyde was a, a political activist in the late 19th and early 20th century and was actually the first president of Ireland. Just want to see if he introduces Croker at the beginning, if he says anything about him. He does, but I can't see where he introduces him. His name is mentioned in the text, all right. Anyway, we'll continue. The Priest's Supper. It is said by those who ought to understand such things that the good people or the fairies are some of the angels who were turned out of heaven and who landed on their feet in this world, while the rest of their companions, who had more sin to sink them, went down farther to a worse place. Be this as it may, there was a merry troop of the fairies, dancing and playing all manner of wild pranks on a bright moonlight evening towards the end of September. And that would make it uh, autumn equinox, by the way. The scene of their merriment was not far distant from Inchigila in the west of the county Cork, a poor village, although it had a barrack for soldiers, but great mountains and barren rocks like those round about it are enough to strike poverty into any place. However, as the fairies can have anything they want for wishing, poverty does not trouble them much. And all their care is to seek out unfrequented nooks and places where it is not likely that anyone will come to spoil their sport. Spoil sport. On a nice green sod by the river's side, were the little fellows dancing in a ring as gaily as may be, with their red caps wagging about at every bound in the moonshine. And so light were these bounds that the lobs of dew, although they trembled under their feet, were not disturbed by their capering. Thus did they carry on their gambols, spinning round and round, and twirling and bobbing and diving, and going through all manner of figures, until one of them chirped out, Cease, cease with your drumming. Here's an end to our mumming. By my spell, I can tell. A priest this way is coming. Sounds a little bit like a, a limerick, doesn't it? And, and away every one of the fairies scampered off as hard as they could, concealing themselves under the green leaves of the Lus Moor, where, if their little red caps should happen to peep out, they would only look like its crimson bells, and more hid themselves in the shady side of stones and brambles, and others under the bank of the river, and in holes and crannies of one kind or another. The fairy speaker was not mistaken, for along the road, which was within view of the river, came Father Horrigan on his pony, thinking to himself that as it was so late, he would make an end of his journey at the first cabin he came to. According to his determination, he stopped at the dwelling of Dermot Leary, lifted the latch and entered with, My blessing on all here. I need not say that Father Horrigan was a welcome guest wherever he went, for no man was more pious or better beloved in the country. Now, it was a great trouble to Dermot that he had nothing to offer his reverence for supper as a relish to the potatoes, which the old woman for so Dermot called his wife, 
though she was not much past 20, <laughs> had down boiling in a pot over the fire. <laughs> he thought, <laughs> sorry, I apologize. He thought of the net which he had set in the river. But as it had been there only a short time, the chances were against his finding a fish in it. No matter, thought Dermot, there can be no harm in stepping down to try. And maybe, as I want fish for the priest's supper, that one will be there before me. Down to the riverside went Dermot, and he found in the net as fine a salmon as ever jumped in the bright waters of the spreading lee. But as he, as he was going to take it out, the net was pulled from him. He could not tell how or by whom, and away got the salmon, and went swimming along with the current as gaily as if nothing had happened. Dermot looked sorrowfully at the wake which the fish had left upon the water, shining like a line of silver in the moonlight, and then, with an angry motion of his right hand and a stamp of his foot, gave vent to his feelings by muttering, May bitter bad luck attend you night and day for a blackguard schemer of a salmon wherever you go. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, if there's any shame in you, to give me the slip after this fashion. <laughs> and I'm clear in my own mind, you'll come to no good, for some kind of evil thing or other helped you. Did I not feel it pull the net against me, as strong as the devil himself? That's not true for you, said one of the little fairies who had scampered off at the approach of the priest, coming up to Dermot Leary with a whole throng of companions at his heels. There was only a dozen and a half of us pulling against you. <laughs> Dermot gazed on the tiny speaker with wonder, who continued, Make yourself, make yourself no way uneasy about the priest's supper, for if you will go back and ask him one question from us, there will be as fine a supper as ever was put on a table spread out before him in less than no time. I'll have nothing at all to do with you, replied Dermot in a tone of determination. And after a pause, he added, I'm much obliged to you for your offer, sir, but I know better than to sell myself to you or the like of you for a supper. And more than that, I know Father, Father Horrigan has more regard for my soul than to wish me to pledge it forever out of regard to anything you could put before him. So there is an end of the matter. The little speaker, with a pertin pertinacity not to be repulsed by Dermond's manner, continued, Will you ask the priest one civil question for us? Dermond considered for some time, and he was right in doing so, but he thought that no one could come to harm out of asking a civil question. I see no objection to do that same, gentlemen, said Dermot. But I will have nothing in life to do with your supper. Mind that. Then said the little speaking fairy, whilst the rest came crowding after him from all parts, go and ask Father Horrigan to tell us whether our souls will be saved on the last day, like the souls of good Christians. And if you wish us well, bring back word what he says without delay. Away went Dermod to his cabin, where he found the potatoes thrown out on the table and his good woman handing the biggest of them all a beautiful laughing red apple, smoking like a hard-ridden horse on a frosty night, over to Father Horrigan. Please, your reverence, said Dermod, after some hesitation, may I make, may I make bold to ask your honour one question? What may that be, said Father Horrigan? Why then, begging your reverence's pardon for my freedom, it is, if the souls of the good people are to be saved of the last day. Who bid you to ask me that question, Leary, said the priest, fixing his eyes upon him very sternly, which Dermot could not stand before at all. <coughs> I'll tell no lies about the matter, and nothing in life but the truth, said Dermot. It was the good people themselves who sent me to ask the question. And there they are in thousands, down on the bank of the river, waiting for me to go back with the answer. Go back by all means, said the priest, and tell them, if they want to know, to come here to me themselves. And I'll answer that or any other question they are pleased to ask with the greatest pleasure in life. 
Dermot accordingly returned to the fairies, who came swarming round about him to hear what the priest had said in reply. And Dermot spoke out among them like a bold man as he was. And then, and when they heard that they must go to the priest, away they fled, some here and more there, and some this way and more that, whisking by poor Dermot so fast and in such numbers that he was quite bewildered. When he came to himself, which was not for a long time, back he went to his cabin and ate his dry potatoes along with Father Horrigan, who made quite light of the thing. But Dermot could not help thinking it a mighty hard case that his reverence, whose words had the power to banish the fairies at such a rate, should have no short of relish to his supper, and that the fine salmon he had in the net should have been got away from him in such a manner. Of course, it, it, uh, we, we will ask you for more Morgan's views on this on Tuesday night, but of course, uh, I have to say, and it's, it's probably fairly obvious, that a lot of the fairy folklore of re recent centuries, and we're talking mostly the past two or three centuries, uh, has coincided with the time uh, when Irish people were seriously superstitious and at the same time super, super, superbly religious uh, and, and, and very uh, closely aligned with their Catholic faith. Uh, but it's a funny old thing, you know, that somebody should be able to see the fairies uh, and yet be able to converse with the priest so easily about the whole thing. I will tell a few more, a couple of short ones. And this is another poem. And it's called The Fairy Well of Lagnane by Samuel Ferguson. And I'm not sure if it's by Samuel Ferguson or if it was collected and written down by Samuel Ferguson. Mournfully, sing mournfully. Oh, listen, Ellen, dear sister. Is there no help at all for me, but only ceaseless sigh and tear? Why did not he who left me here with stolen hope steal memory? Oh, listen, Ellen, sister dear, mournfully sing mournfully. I'll go away to Slemish Hill. I'll pluck the fairy hawthorn tree and let the spirits work their will. I care not if for good or ill. So they but lay the memory which all my heart is haunting still. Mournfully sing mournfully. The fairies are a silent race, and pale as lily flowers to see, I care not for a blanched face, for wandering in a dreamy place, so I but banish memory. I wish I were with Anna Grace, mournfully sing mournfully. Hearken to my tale of woe, t'was thus to weeping Ellen Con, her sister said in accents low, her only sister Una Bon, t'was in their bed before the dawn. And Ellen answered sad and slow, O oh, Una, Una, be not drawn, hearken to my tale of woe, to this unholy grief I pray, which makes me sick at heart to know, and I will help you if I may, the fairy well of Lagnane. Lie nearer me, I tremble so. Una, I've heard wise women say, hearken to my tale of woe. That it before the dews that if before the dews arise, true maiden in its icy flow, with pure hand bathe her bosom thrice, three lady brackens pluck likewise, and three times round the fountain go. She straight forgets her tears and sighs. Hearken to my tale of woe. Just gonna take a note there, that's very interesting. Three times around the fountain, uh, thrice around the well, as in Bowen. Very interesting. All alas and well away. Oh, Sister Ellen, Sister Sweet, come with me to the hill, I pray. And I will prove that blessed freet. They rose with soft and silent feet. They left their mother where she lay. Their mother and her care discreet. All alas and well away. And soon they reached the fairy well. The mountain's eye clear, cold and grey. Wide open in the dreary fell. How long they stood, twere vain to tell. At last, upon the point of day, Bon Una bears her bosom swell, all alas and well away. 
Thrice o'er her shrinking breast she laves the gliding glance that will not stay of subtly streaming fairy waves. And now the charm three brackens craves, she plucks them in their fringed array. Now round the well her fate she braves, all alas and well away. Save us all from fairy thrall, Ellen sees her face the rim, twice and thrice and that is all, fount and hill and maiden swim, all together melting dim. Una, Una, thou mayest call, sister sad, but lithe or limb, save us all from fairy thrall. Never again of Una born, where now she walks in dreamy hall, shall I of mortal look upon. Oh, can it be the guard was gone, the better guard than shield or wall, who knows on earth save Jurla Dwan, Jurla Dawn, save us all from fairy thrall. Behold, the banks are green and bare, no pit is here wherein to fall. I at the fount you may well stare, but naught save pebbles smooth is there, and small straws twirling one and all. Hie thee home, and be thy prayer. Save us all from fairy thrall. Wonderful stuff. Next one's a long one. I think I'll do that in the next episode. We'll continue talking about some of these stories. That one is Tygo Cain. And this is a short one, Paddy Corcoran's wife. I'm sure we might finish after this one. And this is uh, collected or written by William Carlton. Paddy Corcoran's wife was for several years afflicted with a kind of complaint which nobody could properly understand. She was sick and she was not sick. She was well and she was not well. She was as ladies wish to be who love their lords. And she was not as such ladies wish to be. In fact, nobody could tell what the matter with her was. She had a gnawing at the heart which came heavily upon her husband. For, with the help of God, a keener appetite than the same gnawing amounted to could not be met with of a summer's day. The poor woman was delicate beyond belief and had no appetite at all. So she hadn't, barring a little relish for a mutton chop, or a steak, or a bit of mate, anyway, for sure, mate, as in meat, spelt M-A-I-T. For sure, God help her, she hadn't the least inclination for the dry pra- prati, as in the dry spud or potato, or the drop of sour buttermilk along with it, D-H-R-O-P, drop, uh, and with it, W-I-D, it, with it, especially as she was so poorly, and indeed, for a woman in her condition, for, sick as she was, poor Paddy always was, was made to believe her in that condition. But God's will be done, she didn't care. Uh, depression, exactly, Megan, is exactly what I was thinking. A prati and a grain of salt was a welcome to her. Glory be to his name. As the rest roast and boiled that ever was dressed, and why not? There was one comfort she wouldn't be long with him, long trouble troubling him. It mattered little what she got. But sure, she knew herself that from the gnawing at her heart, she could never do good without the little bit of meat now and then. And sure, if her own husband begrudged it to her, who else had she a better right to expect it from? Well, as we have said, she lay a bedridden invalid for long enough trying doctors and quacks of all sorts, sexes and sizes, and all without a farthing's benefit, until, at the long run, poor Paddy was nearly brought to the last pass in striving to keep her in the bitter me, the bitter me. The seventh year was now on the point of closing, when, one harvest day, as she lay bemoaning her hard condition, on her bed beyond the kitchen fire, a little wishy woman, dressed in a neat red cloak, comes in and sitting down by the hearth says, Well, Kitty Corcoran, you've had a long layer of it there on the broad of your back for seven years and you're just as far from being cured as ever. Mavrone, aye, said the other. In troth, that's what I was this minute thinking of 
and a sorrowful thought it's to me. It's your own fault then, says the little woman. And indeed, for that matter, it's your fault that you were there at all. Ara, how is that? asked Kitty. Sure, I wouldn't be here if I could help it. Do you think it's a comfort or a pleasure to me to be sick and bedridden? No, says the other, I do not. But I'll tell you the truth. For the last seven years, you have been annoying us. I am one of the good people. And as I have re regard for you, I've come to let you know the reason why you've been sick so long as you are. For all the time you've been ill, if you'll take the trouble to remember, T-H-R-U-B-B-L-E, and remember, R-E-M-I-M-B-E-R, -R -E -R, your, your children, and that's how a, a lot of Irish people pronounce children, your children, the children thrown out your dirty water after dusk and before sunrise, at the very time we're passing your door, which we pass twice a day. Now, if you avoid this, if you throw it out in a different place and at a different time, the complaint you have will leave you. So will the gnawing at your heart. And you'll be as well as ever you war. War. W-O-R. If you don't follow this advice, why, remain as you are, and all the art of man can't cure you. She then bade her goodbye and disappeared. Kitty, who was glad to be cured on such easy terms, immediately complied with the injunction of the fairy, and the consequence was that the next day she found herself in as good health as ever she had enjoyed during her life. <laughs> and one more, one more. Cushing Lou. One more. Yes, we're at an hour. We'll we'll make it one more, and then we'll 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 say good night for now, and we'll come back tomorrow night. Translated from the Irish by J. J. Callanan. So a lot of the stories, remember, that were collected uh, in the late nineteenth century, particularly and the early twentieth, were collected off Gaelga. They were collected in the uh, in the uh, the native tongue, and had to be translated for English speaking audiences. This song. It's supposed to have been sung by a young bride. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. Or I definitely will scare you all away. Who was forcibly detained in one of those forts, which are so common in Ireland. And to which the good people are very fond of resorting. Under pretense of hushing her child to rest, she retired to the outside margin of the fort and addressed the burthen of her song to a young woman whom she saw at a short distance and whom she requested to inform her husband of her condition and to desire him to bring the steel knife to dissolve the enchantment. Sleep, my child, for the rustling trees, stirred by the breath of summer breeze and fairy songs of sweetest note around us gently float. Sleep, for the weeping flowers have shed their fragrant tears upon thy head. The voice of love hath soothed thy rest, and thy pillow is a mother's breast. Sleep, my child. Weary ha hath passed the time forlorn since to your mansion I was born. Though bright the feast of its airy halls, and the voice of mirth resounds from its walls. Sleep, my child. Full many a maid and blooming bride within that splendid dome abide, and many a whore, H-O-A-R, and shriveled sage, and many a matron bowed with age. Sleep, my child. O thou who hearest this song of fear, to the mourner's home these tidings bear. Bid him bring the knife of the magic blade, at whose lightning flash the charm will fade. Sleep, my child. Haste, for tomorrow's sun will see the hateful spell renewed for me. Nor can I from that home depart till life shall leave my withering heart. Sleep, my child. Sleep, my child, for the rustling trees Stirred by the breath of summer breeze and fairy songs of sweetest note around us 
gently float. Lovely. And sad at the same time, obviously. Uh, and that is a taste of Irish uh, fairy legend. Fairy, sorry. The sun is, and I'm not complaining a bit, because it's lovely to see it. <sighs> yes, indeed. That is the fairies. I'm reading from uh, W.B. Yeats's uh, compilation, A Book of Fairy and Folk Tales of Ireland. This is a, a reprint, a, a modern reprint by Bounty Books, originally published in two separate volumes, Fairy and Folk Tales of the Irish Peasantry, 1888, and Irish Fairy Tales, 1892. And this edition is 1994 uh, Octopus Publishing Group. The stories by Douglas Hyde are used by permission of the copyright holder. So there you are. More tomorrow. I think we'll continue. We'll do more tomorrow. There's kind of sad and funny and happy. There's a mixture, uh, as you would expect. Don't forget, too, that a lot of this lore relates to, you know, the time of the famine and, and its aftermath. And so, of course, you know, uh, uh, topics or, or, or themes such as hunger and the lack of food uh, and people in withered condition and, you know, uh, people in, in poor health and in poor physical and in me poor mental health, uh, you know, w would have been, uh, you know, commonplace. And so, you know, you can see that influence in the stories. And as I said before, uh, Irish people were, were tremendously superstitious and they were also very religious and very Catholic. Anyway, I'm glad to have shared that. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll come back tomorrow and I think we'll continue with more readings from that. Of course, we'll be building up to Tuesday's episode with Morgan, which I'm very much looking forward to. It should be a bit of fun. In the meantime... I hope that you keep all of your you keep each other safe. Don't forget all of the previous episodes are viewable on the Mythical Ireland website at mythicalireland.com. I'm just posting in the link. And it's got all of the previous episodes embedded so you can watch every single one of them if that is your want. And uh, if your, your life is uh, devoid of uh, any pleasure uh, and you enjoy... Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm only joking. Um, some of you... Uh, I know are trying to catch up on episodes that were missed. Uh, and some people who are only just arriving to the series at episode 86 have a lot to catch up on. In the meantime, keep yourselves safe. Uh, I was in the supermarket today. A lot less people wearing masks than I had hoped and a lot fewer people sort of paying attention to each other's physical distancing. It's just something we must not forget for the time being. Uh, in Ireland, uh, unfortunately, people are still dying. However, uh, the government is planning to reopen the country faster than they had originally planned. Uh, and the number of new infections is very, very low. Uh, but sadly, seven people lost their lives today. Uh, so it is still very much uh, a, a thing. What you can do uh, if you're in Ireland or indeed anywhere in the world uh, where COVID-19 is still an issue is to keep washing your hands regularly, maintain your social distancing, please keep apart from other people um, uh, and Wear the old face mask that covers your nose and your mouth if you're out and about. Have a great weekend. Hopefully I'll see most of you or all of you tomorrow evening for more fairy stories. In the meantime, this has been Live Irish Myths, episode 86. I've been Anthony Murphy. I've thoroughly enjoyed your pleasure. And I'm going away to have a glass of wine and uh, hopefully sit and relax for the evening. And we'll talk to you all tomorrow. Icha wa kholosav. Have a sound sleep. Nadina Galer, Mokharja Galer. Uh, and Slán Gafol Movanacht Orif. <laughs>